Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Sir, Angelo Ranella, uh, who is a uh, pediatric cardiologist, uh, trained with us at UCLA, and then went to Boston to do an advanced imaging fellowship, and has come back to Southern California and uh, has a co-appointment at uh, Children's Hospital of Orange County, as well as at UCLA, where he uh, uh, does cardiac MR and cardiac MR research with us. And he's going to talk to us about the role for cardiac MRI in uh, the uh, diagnosis of adult congenital heart disease. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Jamil. Uh, I do want to thank Jamil, Dr. Child, and the course organizers for this opportunity. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Paul Finn and Dr. Moriarty here, my colleagues in radiology. Dr. Finn couldn't make it this morning. But uh, as Dr. Child has said, this, this does require, uh, to do this well, it requires a community concerted effort with, with many smart people that I'm lucky to be around. So uh, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, imaging and magnetic resonance angiography, both the imaging part and the angiography part are performed at the same time during the same study. You'll notice that these, ha these studies have lots of images. Uh, we probably uh, are the modality with the most images in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the bunch. But uh, they are, as you probably know, non-invasive advanced 3D imaging techniques uh, that uh, fortunately do not imply any ionize, imply, uh, employ any ionizing radiation. There's no need for an iodinated contrast agent unless such as used in CT and cath, and there are many uses uh, in uh, congenital heart disease, both of pediatric and adult, uh, which, um, and emerging fetal uses as well, uh, that are just growing by the day as the technology advances. Uh, An important point that Dr. Child made was that, uh, that these, all, these image, all these modalities are complementary to each other and should, should be regarded as complementary, so a given patient may easily get all the above, CT, MRI, echo, 3D echo, and some patients do in fact need them to get the proper information, so that's, they are, they are complementary and not mutually exclusive. Um, the, in certain cases, uh, regarding uh, cath, uh, in certain cases, MRI has helped to avoid invasive testing, or even if t uh, invasive testing is needed, uh, can actually, be, has been shown to reduce the radiation dose since uh, you sort of have a road map of where to go. Uh, uh, the d big downside with cardiac MRI and MRA is that it re does require specialized equipment and personnel uh, which are not widely available and, um, and that, does that still r limits the availability of this technique. What's the safety of cardiac magnetic resonance? Well, it, there are no known harmful effects to fetuses, neonates, children, or adults. Metallic coils and devices, which we get asked about a lot, uh, generally are safe if they've been in place for greater than six weeks. So any of the ASD devices or coils, if they've been in there for more than six weeks, in general, they are safe to image with magnetic resonance. And this, remember, is at 1.5 Tesla, not 3 Tesla. 3 Tesla, there really aren't any guidelines for that. So remember that. And most of our imaging is done at 1.5, although I will show you a few angiograms done on 3 Tesla. Uh, the use of gadolinium-based contrast agents, which are used in MRI, are obviously contraindicated in uh, renal failure due to the risk of uh, NSF uh, or if with any previous adverse reaction uh, to gadolinium, but most people tolerate gadolinium very well. Pacemakers are a relative uh, contraindication uh, to uh, magnetic resonance. There are, you may have heard of some MRI conditional pacemakers in leads which are not yet approved for cardiac magnetic resonance. Those are approved for MRI of the body, head, chest, but they, they tend to, uh, they ask you to avoid the, the heart area. So uh, they're not really cardiac safe, quote unquote. But we have, we have uh, had cases where we've used MRI and pacemakers, but it needs to be done under uh, highly monitored conditions. Um, role of, uh, what is the role of advanced imaging in adult congenital heart disease? Well, um, basically, as an adjunct to standard echocardiography, it's always the go-to uh, technique, particularly in kids, but also in adults. You, you, you go to echo first, and then you see what you can see. Um, if there's suboptimal image, echo, echo image quality, there's a good reason to go to advanced imaging to confirm or refine echo findings. Uh, and in complex congenital heart disease, preoperative planning and then the postoperative follow-up, we find MRI to be very useful. Uh, Dr. Moriarty will, will speak about CT, which is also uh, useful in this regard. Uh, ventricular volumes, mass, and function are very well suited to MRI uh, techniques, and uh, the imaging of extracardiac vasculature is another big indication. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but uh, MR uh, MRI, one of the strengths besides all of the above here are that uh, you can tissue characterize or do a sort of non-invasive biopsy, and we have used it to image scar or you know, scarred, scarred or inflamed myocardium, which can be done with the uh, late gadolinium enhancement techniques. 
Uh, so what I'm going to do now is just take you through a standard comprehensive cardiac magnetic resonance uh, study, and I'm going to use to trial, uh, some patients here with the trilogy of Fallot to, to sort of highlight what we do and what the sequences are, and these are the sequences you may see as you step through a cardiac study. So we start uh, typically with three plain localizers. These are very fast, non-breath held. Uh, these take about, you know, five, six seconds each to go through the, the planes. This is an adult patient with a uh, repair to trilogy of Fallot. This is a coronal. Um, uh, image, this is the, in the, using the SSFP technique. This is a balanced T1, T2 technique that we use a lot. Some uh, centers will use black blood, where you see a lot of, um, look a lot darker than this image. But uh, this is just a standard uh, localizer. And as we go from front to back, you get a really good, you know, quote, lay of the land here. Uh, you get all your segmental anatomy you know, just on one glance. Uh, you can see the right ventricle is enlarged just by looking at this just really quick scan. And so this helps the technologists uh, plan the uh, subsequent scans. This is a, an axial of the same. Um, and here's a heart here. Uh, you can see the branch PAs there flying through. And you can, uh, really good for like visceral anatomy here. Uh, the stomach on the left, the liver on the right, and so forth. We also do one in sagittal here. Um, so j j just how we start out. Uh, the next thing we'll do is go through using those localizers uh, to get some more SSFP or also called bright blood imaging to get some cine uh, images, uh, uh, you know, very analogous to echo, uh, echo short axis images, and we'll get images in various planes, which I'll show you. But this is a repair to trilogy of patient. You can see from base headed all the way to the apex here. This is a quite enlarged RV. You can tell right away. Obviously, uh, in MRI, we like to wait uh, to, uh, till we quantitate and, and, and get the volumes before we, we, we do a qualitative ass assessment because uh, that's what our strengths are. But uh, you can already see this is really big. Uh, here's the uh, dilated outflow tract here of the trans where the transaminer patch is. Um, if you look at this image here, it's interesting. The, uh, this requires very, the, the patient to be very still and to hold their breath. And this image up here, this one, if I'm losing my point here, but uh, you can see it's a little blurrier than the other ones. And this uh, patient had a hard time holding their breath on that slide. So it is really important that they do hold their breath and sit still for usually an hour. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, so it's not easy. <coughs> so, yeah. That's it. It's average time, by the way. Um, so this is the uh, uh, view uh, using SSFP bright blood CNE imaging of the LVOT and then in, in the perpendicular plane. And one, one important I want to emphasize here with this view is this truly is a 3D technique. You can get any plane you want. If you prescribe three points in space, uh, you can get, basically get any plane, um, any vascular structure, conduit, whatever you need. Um, this is a nice view of the uh, right ventricular outflow tract uh, here. Uh, you can see the wall motion. You'll see the flattening of the septum in diastole, which indicates a lot of pulmonary regurgitation, which you can actually see the jet coming through back here in diastole. Uh, we can quantitate that with flow imaging. This is another uh, repair to telogy flow of patient that has had a homograph repair of the pulmonary valve. You can see the, the homograph pulmonary, competent homograph pulmonary valve here. Moving forward through the different planes, we get a really nice view here uh, that is really hard to get by echo. Usually you have to get this subcostal. Uh, and usually just happens in babies or young children. But this is a uh, RV inflow outflow view. You just see the entirety of the RV, truly a triangular uh, pyramidal shaped structure. This is the pulmonary valve here. This is the tricuspid valve here. See this patient has a little bit, a little flash of tricuspid regurgitation at the end, uh, beginning of systole here. Then uh, this is how we segment, quote unquote, the, uh, the heart. This is how we get our mass volume and function of both ventricles. You'll see that as this short axis steps through each slice, you'll see these flashing uh, white circles. Uh, this is, we manually trace these. Uh, this is how we get the end diastolic volume and the systolic volume when these are all added up uh, because an area times a volume, uh, times a thickness will equal a volume. Uh, this is how we get the volumes, mass, and function. And it's, again, qu quantitative, and it doesn't depend on any geometric assumptions. This is a true volume of what you see. Uh, we get this type of data out here. Now, this is hard to see, but on the left side, this is, for example, the left ventricle. We'll get an EF. Here it says 58%. Uh, we'll get a stroke volume, a cardiac output, a mass, and then we can normalize all the values by dividing by body surface area. Uh, to get those values uh, normalized. So these are very useful. Uh, and in Tetralogy of Fallot, the right ventricular parameters are now shown to, to um, link to outcomes. This is another type of imaging that we do. Um, 
during the same study. It's called uh, phase contrast velocity and flow imaging. And without getting into the physical details, basically, it, uh, uh, when hydrogen atoms move, they, they cause a phase shift. And this is detected by the scanner. Uh, and, and you'll see here, I'll uh, just point, they look, they look kind of disorienting at first. But if you look right here, in, uh, this is the pulmonary valve annulus of a repaired child GFLO patient. And you'll see the white is the systole and the black is diastole. So to and fro flow through the pulmonary valve. We can put a region of interest uh, and actually track how much volume is going back and forth. This is the same thing here in the aortic valve. Now we can do that for the aortic valve. And we can do this for any vessel, Fontan conduits, glands, uh, pulmonary veins, collaterals. And basically, it comes out with a volume versus time curve. And this is the stroke volume of the forward volume, the area under the curve here. The area below the curve, under the curve here, uh, is the reverse. So you can see almost, almost the entire, this is basically a 50% regurgitation fraction. Uh, it's a very severe pulmonary regurgitation coming through that valve. We can actually quantify it here. Uh, and uh, So that's moving away from the imaging portion of the study. We move to the angiography portion of the study. This is where we give the contrast. And this is a high spatial resolution uh, contrast enhanced MR angiogram, which is also a 3D um, technique. And you'll see here as we step coronal from front to back, that this is the typical dilated aorta in a tetralogy fellow patient. You'll see the, um, uh, the descending aorta here, the PAs. Uh, you also note that you get some really nice imaging of the liver vasculature and the kidney vasculature, renal vasculature here. You'll note here on the LPA, that little stump is actually a former BT shunt that was uh, uh, taken down when the patient was repaired. So the patient was initially palliated with a BT shunt. Uh, we also have employed the use uh, of a time resolver dynamic angiogram. Uh, and I'll show it to you here. Basically, this is actually, this uh, sequence is used to time the sequence I just showed you. Uh, and this is, you'll see um, a uh, injection from the right extremity coming into the SVC, into the right atrium, and I'll play it here. And we actually get about one frame per second here. So clearly not the, the temporal resolution of a cath, but um, pr pretty, pretty good. You can get to see the, the blood flowing through the body here. Again, we'll use this to time the actual angiogram, the high, the high spatial resolution angiogram. Um, but you'll see that, and if you, we do some post-processing, invert it, and uh, you know, display it like a, like a standard angiogram here. Uh, but you can see all the, uh, uh, the PAs are dilated here. Uh, if there were any significant shunts, we'd see the blood on the left side coming back to the right side. And we've actually, I'll show you a case where we, this was very useful in the patient's diagnosis. Uh, it's also good for checking out collaterals uh, that, that arise from glens, status post to glen. If you have any vena venous collaterals, that's a useful technique. This is what we get when we post process the high spatial resolution contrast enhanced angiogram, and we'll get this 3D volume rendered, which we really can uh, cut and turn in any direction. This is really a full body, uh, full chest and abdomen, uh, I should say, uh, evaluation uh, of a, this is a normal patient actually, but. Um, we just wanted to, to show you that we really can get an excellent view. The pulmonary veins here coming to the left atrium, the aortic arch coming over here. Uh, this is the uh, celiac trunk, the SMA, the renal arteries, and the head and neck vessels are up there. Um, let's do just a few other uh, lesions. This is a, a, actually a child with uh, a mildly unbalanced AV septal defect. You can see the AV canal here, single valve, uh, a large VSD here, and obviously nearly common atrium. Uh, this patient came to, the, came to our scanner because uh, they were contemplating a full bi biventricular repair. In the initial echocardiograms, there was concern uh, that this left ventricle was too small uh, for biventricular repair. This is the short axis imaging of the same patient. You see really nicely the, the common valve here, the common AV valve here in short axis. As we move, and the big VSD, as we move to the apex, uh, actually, the, the um, septum reconstitutes, and the LV nearly makes it to the apex. So when we did, uh, um, uh, we did further imaging where, where I, I was able to sort of play surgeon, which is always kind of nice when you don't have to hurt anybody, uh, and create a uh, ventricular septal de uh, defect patch and sort of divide the valve. We, you can't see these, but we did some, some uh, area measurements and basically some volume measurements of the LV and found it to be adequate. This patient actually went for biventricular repairs doing very well. And the MRI had a lot to do with that decision. This is an adult patient with a um, L loop or congenitally corrected 
uh, just to add some more of that terminology, Dr. Chow, uh, L-loop, or congenitally corrected transposition, uh, you can easily see this is a uh, full view of the chest here. Mesocardia, the heart's right in the middle, which is typical uh, of this condition. Uh, and you have here, you see the LV here on the right side of the patient and the RV on the left side of the patient. There's the uh, abnormal connection of the left atrium to the RV. I didn't show the outflow tracks, but you can see uh, really nicely the function and um, the position inside the heart. And this is a very large heart for this chest, as you can see. Uh, here is the, uh, another patient with uh, congenitally correct, corrected or L-loop transposition af uh, status post an RV to pulmonary artery conduit. Uh, and I'll just uh, highlight just a couple of features. There's the LA to the RV to the aorta. That's a double discordance, as we say. Uh, a little bit of uh, aortic regurgitation can be seen here coming back in diastole. And then I'll highlight that this patient actually has two outflow tracts. This is the native pulmonary outflow tract, which was stenotic, and this is why they jumped it with a conduit. And you can see the conduit is now stenotic. So this was very helpful in uh, surgical planning of the revision. This is another technique that we've used a little bit here. This is a non-contrast angiogram. So we actually, this patient just sits there breathing, doesn't even have to hold their breath, just kind of lays there. And we get a full, uh, a whole heart, they call it, a 3D SSFP uh, angiogram, which is quite remarkable. There's actually no any contrast in here. Uh, this is a, a patient with D-loop, or the standard garden variety transposition uh, that has had repair. And you can see that uh, uh, these are the branch pulmonary arteries draped over the aorta. Um, you, you, you'll notice that. I'll back up for a second to show you that we see that we saw the coronary arteries pretty well, too. Uh, this would be the tech. If you're going to see coronary arteries by MR, this, I guess, would be the technique to try. Here's the one coronary. There's the left over there. Uh, so a nice evaluation of that patient postoperatively. Here's a bicuspid aortic valve, a fusion of the right and non-cusp. Uh, a very tight orifice area, uh, orifice area here, and then in the lower uh, right, these patients have aortopathy, so uh, you see the dilated ascending aorta and the stenotic jet, a very large aorta. Uh, and then as we volume render the angiogram on this patient, you'll see that the, the aorta you know, essentially is the size of the RV. It's very, very impressive. Um, and the other post-processing techniques, another child, this is actually a child with a bicuspidotic valve with stenosis and regurgitation. We can sort of, you know, make it look like color Doppler by uh, encoding it with the velocity here. There's the um, stenosis and regurgitation. You can actually see the Cohenda effect into the uh, first branch there as the, uh, as the yeah, gotcha. Cartation in a baby. I'm going to speed this up now. Uh, in a baby, this is when, it's, when, when they're neonates and then when they're uh, later. Uh, you can follow them, watch the, aorta, the whole aorta here. Left subclavian is missing because it was used for the repair. And uh, here's a nice picture of a pulmonary, uh, pulmonary vein to artery fistula. You can see that right there, that connection. Uh, this, this baby uh, child was cyanotic, and we couldn't figure out why. And the bubble studies were a little bit equivocal as well. So uh, Dan Levy actually coiled that. This, uh, I, might just, I might just leave you with this one. But this is an uh, interesting uh, case where we uh, did a, a 31 year old patient, uh, Jimmy, I think she's your patient, uh, who came in uh, with stroke like symptoms after a bubble study was done. Injection in the right upper extremity, uh, she immediately had TAA like symptoms. So, brought her to the MR scanner. She had a history of pulmonary, a partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection on the right side. Uh, you can actually see that as we inject contrast in the right, it goes immediately to the left ventricle and aorta. So all the bubbles would have gone directly across to the left side. And so we wondered why that was. We, we knew why she had TIA symptoms. We wondered why that was. The angiogram revealed that the native pulmonary venous connection to the azagous vein was still there. And the surgeon had actually just baffled the SVC across to the left to try to fix the, uh, the pulmonary venous connection. But then, of course, as you inject in the left upper extremity, the bubbles come across. Um, and then just a quick word about Fontan. Um, you know, we see lots of types of Fontans in the adult population. These, the ones on the right here, are the more modern style, where the extra cardiac conduit in the Glen, and then you have the traditional or the classic style, with the SVC to the RPA and the RA to the LPA. And you know, uh, basically, we can do angiograms and look um, more in the, both in the arterial phase where you don't see the Fontan, and then in the venous phase where you do see now uh, the dilated IVC and the Fontan. And then um, we'll just leave one last image here of why you don't want a Fontan. Uh, you can see the extremely sludge, sludgy sort of mo uh, motion of the blood here in the Fontan conduit in this single ventricle patient. Uh, but you can see the entirety of the Fontan, both by functional imaging and motion, and also by the angiography. So with that, um, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>